Okay, so greetings everyone and uh, welcome to the 56th session of the online Optom learning series. Let me introduce to you our speaker for today. So today we have Dr. Thomas Arnold. I would address him as Dr. Tom if he doesn't mind. Uh, Dr. Tom is a graduate of the University of Houston College of Optometry and during his training he has participated in various outreach programs in Mexico and a lot of other countries including one in the Indian Health Service uh, and also he has spent two years as a research assistant for the Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study, ETDRS, at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. He is a passionate scleral lens practitioner. He is passionate about fitting scleral lenses because of their ability to help patients who are struggling with compromised uh, corneas. And uh, what more than that, if you see him, his background also is an image of a scleral lens there. He is a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society and is also an associate member of the International Society of Contact Lens Specialists. Dr. Arnold will Dr. Melissa are the co-chairs of the International Congress of Scleral Contacts and it is the first meeting in the world which is dedicated solely to scleral contact lenses. He is also an international speaker and has presented in various countries, including Russia, Poland, India, Jordan, South Africa, Colombia, Mexico, Italy, UK, Australia, and most of the major meetings in the US as well. Dr. Tom currently is a private group practice, is, is actually at a private group practice named the Memorial Eye Center in Sugarland, Texas. And today he's going to share his tips and tricks on how do we go about doing anterior segment photography. So welcome Dr. Tom to our platform OOLS and I would leave the screen time to you now. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here. somewhere in Africa. So I do want to say that I didn't start out taking pictures as a photography enthusiast, uh, even though uh, I have really come a long way in this. I started taking it uh, pictures mainly to document the scurl lens process and the scurl lens fitting. But along the way, I have developed a passion uh, for photography and through the many travels I've done, uh, I do try to document that. And scurl lenses have brought me so much uh, joy in the world, enable me to travel around the world and you know, share this passion with everyone. And, and I'm certainly grateful for your invitation today and to be able to, to talk about uh, some of the tips that we can offer in taking good photographs to increase your knowledge and success with specialty contact lenses. Uh, the famous uh, American photographer Ansel Adams uh, stated, there's no rules for good photographs. There are only good photographs. And so uh, maybe I'll help share some ideas with you. How do you make that better? So we see a variety of conditions uh, in the office, and we certainly want to document that uh, for our own learning and also to share this with uh, other doctors that we may seek their help or maybe lab, lab laboratories would be designing lenses for us. So just a, just a few examples here. I've been very, very um, fortunate uh, to have a lot of my pictures uh, on the cover of uh, Contact Lens Spectrum as well as some other magazines. Uh, they have a column um, every month of clinical images and they've been very generous you know, and, and putting my images up. And actually there's a column in Spectrum called What's the Diagnosis? And I alternate with three other doctors, you know, putting a, a picture up you know, every month and giving you the opportunity to analyze it and you know, share your thoughts, share your guesses about what it is. So you can look for that. So you can learn a lot from taking pictures, uh, a lot about the fitting of your lenses and the conditions, you know, some of your patients. And uh, I'll share with some of, some of these uh, ideas with you here today. 
So there's just some pictures we see. Those of you, those of you who are students may not have encountered scarlins as yet, but um, if you haven't, this is, this is the cornea here. The green band is uh, the tear layer, the post lens tear reservoir or fluid reservoir, We're stained with fluorescein, of course. And then the black band here on the right would be the contact lens itself. So you now we want to look at the clearance uh, of these lenses. And so um, if you can take a good picture of it, it can help. Now that, that shouldn't be there. So <laughs> everybody here has a smartphone. I, I know you do. You probably have more than one. And a lot of these pictures that I'm showing you were taken with a, with a smartphone. I started out with an iPhone four. Uh, I recently bought my wife an iPhone 11, I think. So they've come a long way, but uh, the cameras on most of these, um, cellular phones, whether it's a Samsung or Nokia or Google or whatever, they're actually quite good and you can take a lot of pictures. The trick is to stabilize uh, the camera over the oculars of the soot lamp. So here's one, one example of what we call a bayonet style mounting that you would just affix to the ocular of your soot lamp, like you see there in the right. There are a variety of these instruments, uh, like the one in the upper left, um, can accommodate uh, a number of different sizes of phones. Uh, it's, it's flexible. You can see the one in the bottom, bottom left in the middle is one that uh, has a spring type hinge, uh, which uh, you put the, the phone in and, and it clamps to the uh, clamps to the ocular on the bottom, right? We don't, we, the iPhones are pretty much sailor phones are pretty much, um, taken away the need for these little digital cameras, but they still work very well. And if you look at this picture down on the bottom right, uh, you can see that that is an attachment to the little um, Sony or Casio camera, whatever you have. And that attachment slips into the ocular of the soot lamp itself. Now that, that works very, very well. And then on the upper right, we'll take a couple other pictures of that uh, here in a second. That is a NIDEC or Marco unit, depending on what, what is distributed in your country and, and attaches to the soot lamp. So again, an example here of, of something, this is called a Carson, I think, HD, uh, and uh, again, accommodates a variety of, of phones. This is a unit I, I got recently uh, that I really, really like. It's called the Phone Dock. And again, you can see that um, it, it, it's a spring-loaded system, and so the phone just slips in there, you line up the ocular, uh, and it attaches again with the clamp system uh, works very well on the right here. What that is, that's an auxiliary light source. And so that is nice to have um, to get a full illumination, you know, of the eye and that Nexa uh, in addition to what you have in, in the slit lamp. So uh, it's a nice little unit. Uh, it's called I, I phone dock. And that's uh, from the U S of course. This little unit, this magic, I have never, I've never actually used, but um, those, of, those, those of you who have been practicing a while may remember a ruby lens, which, was, which we used to use before we had the, the 90 diopter and 78 diopter condensing lenses. And uh, that ruby lens fit down into a well right here in the swivel, the swivel area, the pivot area between the oculars and the, um, the, the light source. And so you can remove a little plate there to get access to this little column and this magic eye slips down in there and you can see it has an attachment for your phone uh, and an auxiliary magnification. I haven't used this one, but it looks, looks fairly simple and I'm sure it's fairly expensive. So in the United States, we have something called HIPAA, which is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. Um, you may, I'm sure you don't have this in, in some of your countries, but you might have some privacy laws that you have to be cognizant of. And so the United States would call it HIPAA. So if you're going to take pictures with a smartphone, which, which I encourage you to do, I, if you can buy a separate smartphone and use it only for this purpose. So it's not mixed with your personal uh, information. I would, when you take the pictures, you want to upload them to a server uh, or, you know, another computer where you can analyze them and edit them if, if necessary. And I would, uh, I would create a separate folder for just those pictures. Uh, 
and then I create subfolders with the with the patient name. Um, I also have subfolders of certain situations. So you might have a subfolder for keratoconus, or corneal lenses, or ortho K, or you know eye infections, or whatever you want. But then I also have folders for the patient name. Sorry, I remember a lot of my patients and, and can access them that way. But keep it secure and keep it private uh, so that um, you know, you're not accused of disseminating you know, private healthcare information. Now, this is a little unit I, we saw just a few slides ago. And it's a very, very interesting device. It fits, as you see, in between the objective and the oculars of the slit lamp. Most slit lamps have a little connection there that allows you to detach the oculars uh, from, the, from the objective magnifying lenses. And in that space, uh, you place this little unit and the little black lever that you see uh, flips the image uh, between the oculars and the little iPhone that you see there. Uh, being an iPhone, uh, you have Bluetooth. And so the Bluetooth can be shared uh, to a, another computer or to a screen, a, a TV screen uh, that you have there in your, in your office next to your, in your exam lane that you can take pictures and then show it to your patients, you know, why their eye hurts uh, from an abrasion or iritis, or, you know, you can take a picture of the foreign body that you've just taken out. Really, anterior segment pictures are really, really good um, if you have a lot of blepharitis or demodex. We have this in the United States. I'm, I'm not sure about uh, in Asia, but we have a lot of the mites that infect the lid, lids. And if you're trying to convince uh, one of your patients to clean their lids or the, you know, the need for you to clean them, uh, it's great to capture that and show them in a large image and uh, it, it gets their attention. But this unit's very easy to use. Uh, I say it's presbyopic friendly. Uh, you can see the gentleman there you know, tilting his head back. Uh, but it doesn't interfere with the normal operations of the soot lamp. Takes really, really good pictures. And then you can share it, as I said, to a screen. This was a, a conference uh, last year. This is my good friend, Michael Lipson, on the left. If you do a lot of ortho K, you, you might know Michael. Uh, he certainly is an expert in that area. And we were at a conference and this was a, a lab we were we were conducting and there I think we had about a dozen of these soot lamps with the little Marco uh, instrument there and so we could take turns sharing our uh, images to a, a large screen at the end of the room so it worked out really really well uh, I don't work for Marco or NIDEC I don't have any financial interest in this uh, but it's 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 a nice unit all right, one thing I see a lot um, in amateur photography, um, even in magazines, is uh, vignetting. And we all, we're optometrists, so we know that vignetting means that, you know, we're cutting off the, the side, the periphery of, of the picture. So this is what I mean by vignetting. You take a picture and you see all this black around it, so it looks like you're looking down a tube or a straw. Uh, and what you want is the image more on the right. And the way you get that in a smartphone is when you, when you look at the image that you see on the left, you know how we take our um, fingers and, and either spread them to enlarge uh, the image or bring them together to make the image smaller. We do that to change the magnification on our screen face of our smartphone. Well, what you want to do when you take these pictures is you want to bring this up. It doesn't magnify the image but it enables that image to fill um, the screen of, the, of your cellular phone, and therefore you get rid of all this vignetting. So it's kind of an amateur mistake uh, not to do that. So easy to do. Change the magnification on the screen face before you take the picture. There's um, a variety of instruments that uh, are either a portable slit lamp, like you, like you see here, where you attach, uh, you can attach an, an iPhone or an iPad to this uh, portable slit lamp device, which has a, a magnification lens and a light source. And so if you work in a big clinic or a hospital setting or, or perhaps uh, a university setting, and you're using a variety of rooms, then you can just carry this with you. Uh, and, and take pictures uh, you know, with your iPad. It also is available for the smaller you know, iPhone. Uh, I don't know if it works for uh, other um, 
other cameras other than the Apple cameras, uh, but, it's, but it's a neat little unit. Uh, a variation of that is uh, a ring attachment that you put, and I'll show you this little video here. Uh, one of my assistants is just attaching it. So um, that way it's not a portable slit lamp, you're using the slit lamps you have, and all you have to do is buy this little adapter ring uh, that, and put that on the ocular, and then that whole unit slips on there. So that, that works really, really well, and you have all the resources um, um, and all the bells and whistles that an iPad gives you. So that's, that's also the iPhoto dock. And it takes some pretty good pictures, as you see. Uh, now these are stock pictures. I didn't take them. So uh, that's why you see the vignetting I was talking about. But you can see the difference uh, what that vignetting makes. It'd be better pictures if, if they increase the image size. But that's a very, very good unit. There are also uh, a number of photo apps. Uh, this is a screenshot of, of my iPhone. It was just some random pictures. These photo apps are free and you can change uh, the exposure, uh, the lighting, uh, you can take multiple pictures. It does a lot more than your standard um, camera settings in most smartphones. Um, and so they, there's many of these um, available and I'm sure you can find one that's compatible with whatever phone that you, you happen to be using. But it really, you can, you can increase the quality of your picture, enhance the quality of your picture, I should say, at, right as you take the image. And that makes for a better picture in the long run, and you have to do less editing uh, after you take the picture. All right, so slit lamp photography. So let's talk about that, that for a minute. Um, after several years of taking photographs with my iPhone, uh, I, I realized that this is something I wanted to do with virtually all my patients. And so I invested uh, actually in a photo slit lamp. Um, so if you're in the market for a slit lamp, uh, you might consider you know, spending a, a little bit more money and actually get something with an onboard uh, camera on it. So in my case, the camera's correct, connected directly to the, to the computer via a USB cable. Uh, on your on my computer on my PC, we're running real-time photo software. Now, there's a few tricks to this. Even though you're using both oculars and you're seeing binocularly uh, at the image, the camera is only seeing it monocularly and through the through the left ocular. So you use kind of a you use a gross focus uh, by moving your slit lamp back and forth. The fine focus and the picture you're going to take is what you see on the computer screen. So you actually have to do kind of your gross focus through the ocular and then look away and look at your computer and then snap the image there. And this camera, there's a little button uh, on the joystick and you merely, merely press the button. Uh, and it's easy to switch in these from video to, photograph, to photo mode and back by sit, simply hitting a little button. That's, that's right down here. So if you're going to get a new slit lamp anyway, um, this might be a worthy investment. This is just a screenshot of the computer, and you can see all the little thumbnails that, that I've uh, taken here. And what you can do is just kind of rapidly go through them. Any, any bad pictures, uh, you can just delete there and, and save the others. And so these pictures then will be saved on a server uh, to be accessed by a variety of computers in the, in the office. So the initial image is on the local computer where the slit lamp is hooked up. And then once you save the images up to your server, uh, any computer in the office can access those. So it makes, makes life really, really easy. So there's, there's the camera right there integrated in. Now let's talk about technique for a minute. And this, this applies to um, any camera, whether you're using a smartphone or, or the photo slit lamp. You wanna dim the room lights, including the monitor uh, there, so you don't get a reflection. For looking at um, scleral lenses, you wanna angle your optical beam about 40 degrees you know, from, from the middle. You use white light uh, when visualizing you know, uh, the fluid reservoir in a scleral lens that has um, fluorescein in it. And you want to use a magnification about 10 to 16x. 
Uh, less than that, the image is too small. And more than that, it's very, very hard to focus. The only time I go higher than 16 is probably trying to look for uh, signs of iritis, you know, cells and flare in the anterior chamber, or if I'm trying to look at the endothelium. Uh, but that's, that's a rarity. It's hard to focus at the higher magnification. So in my slit lamp, uh, 10 to X 16 X, you know, seems to work very well. And the other thing is just take a lot of pictures. Uh, take a lot. Um, with, in, the dig, in the digital age, it doesn't cost anything. And storage space is, is very, very cheap. So you take a lot of pictures because patients are moving, they're blinking, uh, you know, so they're not, sometimes uh, they're not as cooperative as we would like them to be. So take a lot of pictures and just discard the ones that uh, don't come out well. Now, the other thing you can do, again, talking about looking at scleral lenses, is you switch the position of the oculars and the, um, and, the, and the light source. So you center the light source over the cornea instead of, and instead of you know, 40 degrees to the side, and you swing the oculars to the other side. So that way you get, you get both angles. So here you see now the, the light source is right in front of uh, our patient here, who happens to be my lab manager. And now the oculars are over to, to one side, and that's how you, you flip it. You just reverse it. So it makes it pretty easy. Take some pretty good pictures, like this uh, 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 Symphony multifocal IOL with retro illumination. And I think that's it's a pretty interesting picture. Now, one thing when you take pictures of the whole adnexa, you want to get the eye and the lids and the conjunctiva you need to diffuse the light source, right? In this slit lamp, um, it's, you have a built-in diffuser, which is this little disc you see, see here on the right. And I don't, I don't see my mouse, but anyway, the, on, the, on the middle right of the picture, you see that little um, kind of frosted looking glass. You swing that over the light source, over the, over the mirror, and that diffuses the image. On the left there, that little black tubular structure is an alternative light source uh, that we use. And it has a rheostat. You, you notice that the top is, has a neural button with um, a little white dot there. And you can vary the intensity of the light. And you remember uh, a few slides ago when we looked at the phone dock, it had an auxiliary light source. So uh, here's one that's, that's built right into the soot lamp, and that's very handy for diffusing the light. So you're not going to get an optic section. You're going to get an illumination you know, of the whole eye. Now, you can be pretty creative with this if you don't have a fancy slit lamp. If you have a um, what we call a Zeiss-type slit lamp with the, the light source not in a column, then you can get a little plastic cup like you see on the left and just drop it over the light source. Uh, or on the right, what that is, that's a daily disposable uh, lens case, which you just take and, and use a paper clip to band edit. So easy, inexpensive. Some people will take a piece of tape, scotch tape, uh, frosted tape, and put over it. But then, then you have to deal with the residue uh, of the glue on the mirror. So I'm not a fan of that. These are, these are easy fixes. And it's just a little close up on it. The, the one on the left, the little cup, is for cold medicine, you know, cough syrup. Uh, and so uh, it's a pretty easy little fix. Now, we've really come to rely on uh, the Rattan filter to enhance the cobalt blue light. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but we really didn't appreciate their use until recently when we started filling a lot of scleral lenses and, and ortho K. Uh, there are many, many types of Rattan filters. The most popular you'll find is a Rattan number 12, and that seems to be uh, the right wavelength for maximum uh, enhancement you know, of the cobalt image. There's a few others you can use, but Rattan 12 seems to be uh, the standard. If you're, again, if you're in the market for a topographer, ask about the built-in camera for the topographer. Uh, this happens to be an Oculus unit, a K5M, um, and a camera is uh, an optional feature of it. Now, as you see, you get an entire um, image of, of the eye. You don't obviously have optic sections and can't do some of the things that, that 
that we talked about earlier. However, they do have video capabilities. So you can look at you know, how the lens moves at the blink and, and centers and, and so forth like that. Also good for tear breakup time. So uh, some of these units, um, I think CSO, which is out of Italy, has a similar unit. Uh, anyway, they're, they're out there. So just keep in, in mind that some topographers actually have a camera you know, built into them. You always want to stay one step ahead, you know, improve your practice, expand your capabilities one step ahead, like this old fellow right down here. He's having, having a good time surfing that wake. Okay, well, let's talk about macro photography, true macro photography. Um, here you see a scarlet lens that has a little bit of leakage uh, on the top portion, and as the patient blinks, he's pumping in these little air bubbles, uh, which we don't want. So that, that tells me that my scar lens is not aligned properly uh, in this vertical meridian, but uh, you can really document it with you know, some cool pictures. So in macro photography, you really do need to get a dedicated macro lens. Uh, and that's defined as a lens that has a focal length of 100 millimeters or more. Uh, I use a Canon because they're fairly affordable. There are a lot of different um, additions, you know, accessories that you can get with a Canon, and I find them fairly easy, fairly easy to use. So a lot of the pictures that we're going to see here in, in a minute, and the pictures uh, on the magazines, which we started off with, I've taken with this camera. This is a, a Canon 70D body, which is really an entry level. This is not super expensive. This whole unit that you see here would be about $2,800 uh, US. Uh, so <clears throat> it is important to have um, a, a flash with this. You really need to put a lot of light on your subject. And that's what you see here. This is called a twin lamp flash. Uh, my good friend, Ed Boschnik, who I learned a lot from. If you follow any, if you follow scar lenses at all, you're probably familiar with Ed. Uh, he's taught me a lot about photography. Uh, this is his unit. Now he is uh, more of a lifelong photographer uh, than I am. And he uses an icon, which of course everybody's familiar with. Uh, he has uh, four uh, flashes on his camera remote. So I have a little flash envy. Uh, I don't think that's available on my camera, but he has really good light. And his, his camera is 105 millimeters uh, macro. And that's what you see right there. And the other thing you want, you notice it's F32, and uh, the students are probably uh, up on this, but if you've been out of, out of school for a while, you may um, not remember that the higher the F-stop, the smaller the aperture. So F32 is almost like a pinhole, whereas uh, F2.8 is a very, very wide image. So what's pinhole do? We all know that it gives us a, a larger depth of field. And to me, when I started, this is counterintuitive because I'm thinking, what kind of depth of field is it? I'm right down on an eye, you know, the, you know, the, the height is, you know, not even a millimeter or, or one or two millimeters at most, but there's a lot of depth in that one or two millimeters. So you want the maximum uh, F-stop, the, the maximum pinhole you can get from any cameras there, that's F32. Now, when you want to set, you're using a, a real camera now, and so you get to have some, use some settings here. You want the image capture speed, which we used to call film speed, and now it's not film, but we still use that same terminology. Uh, and so this is the, the sensitivity of the camera to the image. Uh, in my camera, we start with about 400. Uh, a slow ISO, a very, very slow would be 60 maybe, or then 100 and 120. Very fast ones go up to 6,400 and so forth. The faster the film speed, the grainier the image would be. So faster is not necessarily better. You have to experiment with your own camera. It's going to be uh, unique to your camera if you get one. But uh, 400 is a, is a good starting point. You may go a little faster. You may go a little slower. And just have to look at the quality or, of the image, particu in particular, the graininess of the image. You set the image uh, type to portrait. You want to, you want to manually focus this, but turn on your image stabilizer. You set the magnification of the lens, 
the, 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 the uh, macro lens to maximum, okay, all the way up, and you, the focus zone would be a center spot. And what you do is you just, you, you, you start back farther, you, you have, your, have your lens dialed to maximum, and then you move in, and, and I have a short video to show you. And you're focusing on the images, the light images from your flash. These flashes have what we call, what I call landing lights, which illuminate the, um, the subject. And then you take the flash, and of course, the flash goes off. So you're looking at these landing lights on the re reflected image of the eye, and you move in until those are clear. And when those are clear, you snap the picture. So if I look at the back of the camera, the, these are the settings that we just went through. Raw means that you're, you, you're not compressing the images. It's, it's not a JPEG. It's not a PNG or other thing. It, it, is, it is the full information. And you want that because if you do processing on the level of the camera, then you can't edit the photograph later. So you want raw, which gives you the maximum information. Um, Let's see here. It, this is manual focus. That's the portrait mode that we talked about. And then, well, let me go back a minute. And then C, if you look at the upper left, C means custom. So what you want to do is you, you dial in all these different um, values. You save it as a C in the dial settings. And then that way, if you use your camera for other photographs, if you use the automatic setting or the aperture priority setting and so forth, it doesn't mess this up. When you go to take your macro picture, you can merely go back and, and click to see, and all these settings uh, are, are there. Okay. Let's flip through those again. All right. There we go. Avoid ring flashes. You, you notice that my, my flash and Ed's flash were peripheral. Uh, this, as you see, slips right over. You don't want a ring flash. This was a $700 mistake on my part because that, that ring, that flash is right in the middle you know, of the image and, and you don't want that. Okay, so this, this is how we do it. So that's a little that's a little idea of of, of how you do it. Uh, the room light uh, is important to have it be dark. So we take some pictures, and, and this is these are pictures. And you can see here, uh, you do see the image of the flash, but it's not it's not like that big ring flash there. So I took all these pictures with uh, the units that I just showed you here. This is uh, this is Taryn's marginal generation. This this young girl is only twelve years old, and so we took all these all these little pictures here. That's a uh, eye print lens, uh, a molded lens over a very what we call a proud graft. You can see how it is very much extruded um, and, and flattened on the top. Uh, Chris Christine Sent took this picture, uh, and that's an eye print lens again, a molded lens. I just thought it was a great picture, so I wanted to include it. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, uh, I mentioned editing the photos. Um, iPad has a great little editor called Photos uh, that you can, you can do a lot with. It's built in. It, it is okay to edit. Uh, most of the time, what you're going to do is just crop the image. And you don't want to alter the colors too much or it starts looking pretty unnatural. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this. Uh, uh, this is a quiz question. Uh, sometimes I, I give to my externs, my students. That's a mucin ball. So that's just a, a, a bunch of mucus uh, that through the pumping action of, of the blinks and the, and the eyes and the lens, just rolled it up to a big old ball. So this is underneath the scleral lens in the fluid reservoir. The patient had no idea it was there. It wasn't blocking her vision or anything, uh, but uh, I thought that was a pretty, pretty fun picture. And so these are some of the processing uh, options you can do. You can see on the bottom of the screen, uh, you can do different things to enhance the picture, but don't, you know, don't, don't mess with it too much or it, it'll really look unnatural. 
So this is one um, little program I use. It's free. Uh, you can see that it's okay for, it's approved for Apple and, and Google. It's called Bold Dive. And you can, you can mark up uh, things and, and do stuff like this uh, with your image, uh, write on it, you know, put illustrations on it and so forth. You can even uh, use it to have, make a collage. You know, you can have one picture of, uh, or, you know, one picture with, you know, four or five different um, individual pictures in it, uh, what we call a collage. So anyway, it, it works real well. It's free and you can use it. All right. So we started off with Ansel Adams. You know, we talked about uh, his photographs, which are, which are really quite famous. And he said that but the single most important element of a, of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. So, you know, think about it. Think about your picture. And I, I do want to leave you with this one thought. The you can edit pictures for color for sharp you know color and and mark them up and do all sorts of stuff, but you can't focus the picture. Okay, the picture that you take will be focused in, in however you have taken the picture. So if it's out of focus, these editors won't help you. So it is really important when you're capturing these images to pay attention to the focus, the lighting, the exposure, even, even the color temperature uh, can be altered, but you can't improve uh, a, the focus of a blurry image. So, you know, pay attention to that. Try to get the clearest shots uh, that you can. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a good motto from, uh, you know, the very famous physicist Stephen Hawking, you know, the greatest image, enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. So always keep an open mind, uh, you know, keep learning. Uh, you can never know too much. I, I tell, I tell people I learn something from every patient every day. So it's, it's good inspiration. So anyway, thank you for having having me. I really enjoyed it. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, here's my, some of my personal information. That's my email. Uh, Melissa Barnett and I have a Facebook page, Scarlet Lens Practitioners. Uh, you have to answer some questions to join it, um, and, but we're happy to have you. Um, I have an Instagram page and, and coming soon, uh, Dr. Barnett and I are starting a podcast series called Globalize. We're going to, the, the first, uh, first episode will be in uh, September. And so uh, we hope that you will uh, watch your podcast feeds and, and look for Globalize as we speak to practitioners all over the world, just, just as in, just like I'm speaking to you today. So again, thanks a lot. That's me. And I guess, do I stop sharing? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Tom, for that very insightful uh, tips, what you have shared with us today. As I was just saying that, uh, thank you very much for doing this. It was a very early morning for you. So, That's fine. yeah. So we, we have a couple of questions. I'm just going to share that on the screen. Uh, the first question is, what's your advice? Should one invest in a slit lamp camera or devices? Uh, that help us to use, you know, the phone, phone camera are equally good. So what's your advice? Should we really, if you're looking at a new uh, slit lamp uh, investment? No, not necessarily. Uh, that, that's personal preference. You can take very, very good pictures with your smartphone. So you don't, you don't need a photo slit lamp to take superior pictures. Um, if, I think the most economic, most economical thing is, you know, get a good cellular phone, uh, find the attachment that works with that. And I would get uh, a, a macro camera like, like where we ended the session with, because a macro camera like that, like I said, for me, it was about $2,800. Um, and uh, a photo slit lamp, my photo slit lamp was almost uh, $20,000. So if you don't need a new slit lamp, um, I wouldn't necessarily invest in the photo slit lamp. You can take great pictures um, with your cell phone and uh, then spend the money on a, a macro camera. Uh, but if money is no object or you need a slit lamp, uh, the, the camera option only adds a couple of thousand dollars to it. So. Hope that okay. helps. Yeah. And I think the, uh, the point which you mentioned really struck me because if you use a phone, you can nowadays, you have a smart TV everywhere, you know, in your practice, probably you have a smart yeah. TV. And yeah. from the phone, 
you can connect it to a big TV where not only the patient can view it, but if there is any attendees, uh, you can explain it on a bigger screen and then make your right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I think rather that, that would be more uh, apt in this situation, I guess. Yeah, and I think you know the little unit I showed you, the Marco Nidec unit, which you, you know you place in between the ocular and the objective. You know, the little little iPhone that was above, you know, the eyepiece. I think that I, I don't remember the exact price of that. But I think it's five or six thousand uh, dollars. I don't think it's more than that. So that's a lot cheaper than a twenty thousand dollar full soot lamp. Now you have to contact that company, Marco Nidec, to see you know which soot lamps it's compatible with. But it, there's a, there's a good chance that it may be compatible with the soot lamp you already have. And so that's a real nice unit. I've used it, and that's that's a very easy to use. Yeah. Okay. And the next question is uh, asking about what, which universal phone adapter do you, would you want to suggest? Is there any personal preference? No, I, no, I don't have any personal preference. Uh, the very first one I showed you was, was very old, the bayonet type. The, uh, the one that says phone dock, which was the, the, the blue screen with, with, remember I said it has the auxiliary light source to the side. That's really good. I think it's a couple of hundred dollars and fits uh, fits most any phone. So that that's a good one. It's called Phone Dock. Uh, it's yeah. from uh, California. So okay. so that's a good one. But I you know I don't. What it depends on your camera and it depends on your soot lamp. And all those are fairly. Um, a lot of those are fairly inexpensive, like less than a hundred bucks or maybe two or three hundred at at most. Yeah. Yeah. And one more. What what technique do you want to usually use to see fluorescence under the tear reservoir? I mean, uh, you did mention about the angle forty, about yeah. forty. There, would you like to elaborate more about that? Uh, if well, sure. Uh, so that fluorescein gets in there. Uh, we put it in the bowl of the scleral lens, of course, so that when we're filling the the bowl with saline uh we dip a fluorescein strip in there and and we put up you know we 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 dip it repeatedly and really light it up so i would use a lot of fluorescein um and then uh, as i said uh, it's you're looking at it under white light uh, to see the optic section so no you just um it needs to be very bright you have to have a good slit lamp uh a slit lamp that really makes the light bright but no there's nothing, there's no real technique to that. Um, when you want to see the entire uh, eye at once, then that's when you put in your uh, cobalt blue filter, your blue filter, and you can add a ratin over the top, and that'll light up the whole thing. But for, for the optic section, you use white light. What are the other settings other than the aspect ratio and brightness within the phone uh, a practitioner must be aware of? Is that really necessary? Uh, I mean, you did share about the room brightness, uh, you know, try to minimize it. Uh, the screen brightness or the computer brightness, if you are using, should be minimized to, to avoid any reflections. But yeah. uh, do you have any, uh, you know, anything which you should do in? In your phone particularly any any settings you would do on your phone no i can't no i really can't think of any um uh, the the little other than the, remember i showed you some of the um i showed you a, a, a screenshot of, of a program to to you know change the settings uh, of your phone uh, what the most useful thing about that is the exposure so as you're okay. looking at the picture, if you can all, if you can all um, alternate, not alternate, uh, adjust, adjust the exposure, uh, that is very, very helpful. Exposure is different than the light settings of your slit lamp. So I think that would be useful. Um, the other thing you can do, uh, I think this is unique to iPhone. I don't know about uh, Samsung's or some of the other Google phones, but you can as you're looking in the photo mode of your iPhone, you touch the screen. There's a little uh, 
box that that appears a little gold box and you can you know use your fingers to make it bigger or to make it smaller that that sets the focus all right um, and there's also next to that little box there's a little slider and that is that is an exposure setting and i think if you tap it it fixes the focal length uh or yeah. the, the focus of the lens so that that's that's built into an iphone so you want you want to you want to uh you know you want to zero in on where you want to focus and you want to fix the focus there so that's how you do that okay and i think that there are certain apps like you have shared with us the editing apps which you normally prefer but there are certain apps through which we can take the image uh, not only using the default camera app on the phone but yeah. there are certain apps uh, you know specifically where you want to beautify the image and all that so do you have yeah. any experience on those and would you recommend using those uh, specific capturing apps for taking the images well yeah the, the one i showed you was is is the one i have on on my phone i forget i forget what the name of it is let me look i have it here it's called pro camera it's it's okay. called pro camera so this is what I showed you. Oh, look at that. It's called, um, it's called pro camera and it okay. has, it has different, it has different settings here. It has exposure settings and all sorts of different things. So that's free. It's called pro camera. And then for photo editing, as I said, I just use, um, what's in the iPad or I okay. use mold dive M O M O L D I V. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your experience and you know giving up, uh, giving us these tips on uh, how to take uh, better images. I think people were taking images, but uh, we probably were not that great. But with your tips, I think we will go back to our practice and then uh, try to take better images now so that it is used for not only for clinical purposes, but also for monitoring our patient's condition and also Absolutely. for legal practices yeah that that's how i started off just to just to learn and, and to monitor and it, it's very very useful and then it also helps when you have to give a lecture <laughs> yeah that's true thank you so much for doing that uh, thank you very much again my pleasure yeah. yeah so just to be uh, reminding our attendees we are also in a plan of uh, starting the online case presentation series so we request if you have any interesting cases to be presented, please visit our website. There is a link to submit your abstracts. You could go and submit your abstracts there and we would get back to you and schedule your presentation. We do have sessions uh, on the next weekend. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tom, once again for taking out the Pleasure. time early on a Sunday morning. Uh, I Good hope everyone. Stay safe, okay, take care and bye-bye.